now from the University of Virginia Center for Politics. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Glenn Crossman. I am the Director of Programs for the UVA Center for Politics. On behalf of Larry Sabato and everyone at the UVA Center for Politics, we're happy that you're able to join us this evening. Larry regrets that he's unable to attend in person tonight, but he has a prior commitment through 9 p.m. Uh, that we were unable to reschedule. As you may have heard, tonight's premiere is more than 10 months in the making. And while I know that students were glad to finish the documentary, our hope is that this represents a beginning rather than a finale. Uh, the message they convey in this film and the example they set is one that we challenge you in the audience and everyone across the country to replicate. And that will become clearer after you watch this film. Starting today, the students have launched the Common Grounds Campus Challenge, uh, which you will hear more about tonight. On a related note, the Center for Politics has partnered with Unify America. You can participate in a one-on-one -on -one virtual discussion with a person of the opposite political ideology by going to centerforpolitics.org and clicking on the slide for Unify America. In early spring, we will also host another partner, Resetting the Table, to conduct an interactive discussion with the public again aimed at finding common ground. Um, if you're tweeting about tonight, and we hope you are, uh, please use the hashtag hash it out. It's hashtag hash it out. So let's get started. Larry taped an introduction to the film earlier today. And again, we thank you all gathered here at the Rotunda and for those who are watching online. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And Happy Veterans Day, probably the most important thing we can say to open up. We salute and thank all of our veterans for their service to our nation. Because of their sacrifices, we're able to live in peace here at home, at least on most days. Uh, we can assemble in gatherings like this. We can exercise our rights to speak out. Uh, we can disagree civilly and come together for the greater good of our nation, as the men and women in service to this country have done since the dawn of the Republic. We're here in the famous dome room of the wonderful Rotunda on this important day to showcase the work of a group of students who looked at the hypercharged partisan environment that this country, our country, finds itself in. But rather than just complaining about that hyperpartisanship, or worse yet, uh, contributing to it, as we all do from time to time, and we shouldn't, they chose a better path and they decided to try to do something about it through example, if nothing else. For most of us, when we need help with a big project, we go to our friends and family. Uh, when we need allies to back us up, we naturally turn to people who probably agree with us anyway, because we're more comfortable with that. That was not the case for these five students uh, connected to the Center for Politics. They were interns with us and excellent interns at that. In their search for common ground, these students decided to seek out and partner with people with whom they disagree politically. 10 months later, 10 months after they started, we're delighted to showcase their successful efforts in the documentary that they put together, they scripted, they filmed, and they worked incredibly hard on it. The goal was never to have students compromise their political beliefs but to see whether they could look beyond disagreements to achieve a shared objective. The behavior of the students as shown in this documentary might just be the key to fixing many of the ills that poison our view of politics today. I want to acknowledge each of the students who led this effort. Raid Gillum, who I met on the lawn during the pandemic, except we were separated by, by uh, dozens of yards. <laughs> But uh, he was filming on the lawn. We met that way and turned out I taught his father. Uh, he's a fourth year foreign affairs major, and he's the director of tonight's film. And he is a perfectionist. I can tell you that much. Molly Hayes is a third year with a major in leadership and public policy. And Molly is the assistant director of the film. Miranda Hertz is a production assistant and a third year with a government and German language major. Sean Pivovar is a fourth year government major and is the second assistant director. I don't know whether these titles precisely describe what they did or not. They all work together very well, that I can tell you. 
Uh, Victoria Spioto is a production assistant, and she actually took her degree from the university last year with a bachelor's and master's in teaching in elementary education. Thomas Driscoll, who appears in the film, is a fourth year history and foreign affairs major and was responsible for marketing and social media for the film. And I'm sure that will continue now that it's being formally released. Finally, uh, Vidar Hageman is a second year student with a major in religious studies. Vidar is also in the film and filling in on the panel tonight for Victoria, who's not able to join us this evening as uh, one would hope and expect she has a very good job now uh, teaching in Northern Virginia. Uh, I'm very proud of all of them. We at the center are very proud of all of them and glad they are associated with the Center for Politics. And I'm sure you will be too when you see the product of their hard labors. So let's get to it, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of these talented students, it's our pleasure to present to you Common Grounds. Hello, we're some of the students who created the film you're about to watch. From first idea to final cut, this was an entirely student-run production. Now, the film does deal with sensitive, politically charged topics, and making it definitely took us out of our comfort zones. We come from very different backgrounds and we hold widely different political beliefs. But we shared a goal and that was to bring this film to life. We invite you to lean in even when some of this might feel uncomfortable or downright infuriating and listen to the end with an open mind. We hope you enjoy the film. I care a lot about the Constitution and patriotism. I care about um, a living wage for everyone. I care about racial equity. Um, economics. It's freedom of speech and the First Amendment. Reproductive rights, queer issues, LGBTQ rights. Uh, Pro-life issues are big to me. Prison abolition. Gun control and gun violence. Right to life, um, gun rights. Simply kind of returning a sense of civility to politics. Um, I'm definitely more on the liberal side. I'm very much so, uh, I would say, principled conservative. A very staunch, like, moving to, like, leftist. And I identify as a progressive. Progressive liberal. I'd say Democrat. Conservative. Conservative. Center-right, uh, libertarian. I'm a socialist. I made the decision to run for president after Charlottesville. Close your eyes and remember what you saw. August 11th and 12th, 2017. That was a news story that was entirely separate from a location. It was the word Charlottesville that was an amorphous concept, not a real place. This is still today how they talk about Charlottesville in the news. Hundreds of white nationalists storming the University of Virginia. A car was driven into a crowd in the U.S. city of Charlottesville, Virginia. It was one of the darkest chapters in recent memory and led to a firestorm of controversy that encompassed the city, the nation, and the presidency. 
I toured UVA exactly a month before that. And I remember it was my first time being in Charlottesville and I was like, this place is like so idyllic, it's so nice. Like I knew nothing about UVA history. I got here and I saw just how, you know, this is literally, used to be a slave plantation. UVA was definitely like the perfect place for something like that to happen. It took me until well into my first year to realize no, they were walking the lawn. The Thomas Jefferson statue that's like right over there, um, that was where people were surrounded by neo-Nazis. 100% what August 11th and 12th should have done is, is reaffirm the idea that this is not something we stand for, condone as an institution, as a society, as, as, as a people. And it of course should plunge us into a discussion. And that's where though, you need to make sure that you're showing respect just for the sake of the fact that they're human and have human dignity. There are going to be different sides of an issue that everyone agrees on. Unfortunately, since that event, I don't think things have um, gotten better. They're just kind of simmering um, under the surface. If you want the Thomas Jefferson statue, then you must be a white supremacist. You want this, you want um, Lewis and Clark, you must be a white supremacist. Um, all, all, all kinds of insanity. I love the fact that UVA was founded by Thomas Jefferson. I love what Thomas Jefferson did for the country. I love that I'm at this school that is so historic. I support this statement by President Ryan. Quote, as long as I am president, the University of Virginia will not walk away from Thomas Jefferson, end quote. History is a story, but I think its entirety should be told. Um, and so the good parts of it, I don't think, um, should make you not talk about the bad parts, and, and that goes for Jefferson. But on the same, uh, the other side of the token, the, the bad parts don't get to negate the good outright. And to walk away from Jefferson would be to do exactly that. You know, the, the ideals of democracy, of religious liberty, of that, that built the nation that we're in today. The good it's produced, I think, at the university um, and across the world, honestly. You know, I think it saved the world from the brink of destruction. I think it's helped a lot of people in the process um, and produced our country, at least probably the most good for the most people in human history and to walk away from that and not grapple with it because of dark evil parts of his past don't get me wrong i don't think does anybody a, a genuine service i don't like that quote by ryan in general just because student activists and student organizers we're not asking the university to step away from thomas jefferson we're asking them to like paint the whole picture when you put a man like that on a pedestal, you're not really allowing, you know, the other narrative to come in of, you know, the fact that he started raping Sally Hemings when she was 15. The Small Collections Library has tons of his documents, and a lot of those documents, he's basically saying that, you know, black people are subhuman, that they don't have a place in American democracy. And that's also the funny thing. It's like, when we're talking about Thomas Jefferson and this great legacy, you know, these ideas, you know, it's like justice for who? Democracy for who? Uh, uh, to respond to a little bit of that, um, I would say when we ask like democracy for who or who the university was for, I think the answer is right here, the people sitting in the room. I think the answer is the people going to the university currently. Um, no matter what Jefferson's exact vision was, um, we were able to take it and we were able to perfect it using the history that we got to see, using um, everything that happened, everything that he did wrong and everything that he did right, um, we were able to correct that. The reason we are all here is thanks to Thomas Jefferson. He built this school. Um, maybe at the time it wasn't intended for any of us. To say that I'm thankful for that or that I want to honor that is not to say that any commentary on slavery or any of the things that happened. I think it's an immense privilege to be able to take Thomas Jefferson's ideas and that be the most important part of him to you. 
Um, like my ancestors were not the people that Thomas Jefferson owned and brutalized. And I think because of that, it's, it's a lot easier for me to kind of go, oh yes, his writings are so great, right? To kind of divide this person. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that for a lot of people, that is just an impossible thing to do. When we say Thomas Jefferson is the reason why the University of Virginia is here, it's like, that's a part of it, right? But let's also talk about the fact that the reason why the University of Virginia is here is because the University of Virginia knocked down historically black neighborhoods to build, you know, parts of the campus and to build the hospital. Let's talk about that. Like, let's talk about the fact that over 5,000 slaves built common grounds between the years 1817 to like the 1860s. Like, that's why the university is here. Slavery is the reason why the university is here. We just have to paint the whole picture. Comment on a couple of things. Uh, so for example, being that it's a privilege to say, well, I can go and I can take his writings and I can say I like that. I think um, that's what history is, being able to take the good parts of people and say, this is what we're going to uphold and the bad parts and saying, this is what we're going to leave behind. Um, Woodrow Wilson, a lot of people hold him up as this progressive, but he also, he showed um, birth of a nation in the White House, who's probably a Klan's member. And people will openly make that choice, say no, Woodrow Wilson was still a good liberal progressive. And I agree with you, we definitely have to paint the whole picture. Um, and we can't just say, oh, look at this great architecture. We have to also say, who built the architecture, right? That, that's completely understandable. I think the political environment at UVA right now is very tense, <laughs> and I think that is the culmination of the events of the last five, six years. Trump's election in 2016, the events of August 11th and 12th, um, the 2020 election, uh, the insurrection at the Capitol. Unfortunately, what you see are two very um, bipolar extremes. The first ones that obviously come to mind are, you know, on the left you got YDSA, and on the right you got YAF. I'm chair of the Young Democratic Socialists of America. I am involved in Young Americans for Freedom at UVA. I'm the president of the club. I've met a lot of people who don't know that I'm conservative and there's no problems and everything's normal. All those things that we have in common um, are kind of overlooked and that comes from people getting so much into the binary of good and bad being associated with left and right. As soon as they find out you're conservative, they might say, well, you hate women, you hate immigrants, you hate everybody, essentially. There definitely has been this big like divide between students, which is unfortunate because really I think that we need to like remember that like our enemy is like, you know, UVA administration, you know, it's the Board of Visitors, it's, you know, kind of white supremacy in general. If we really want to see white supremacy and bigotry and fascism off of our campus, we need to be organizing it off of our campus. We need to be out organizing these people, right? Cancel culture is a problem in university culture and young culture, in this leaning Marxist culture where if we don't like it, we're just going to get rid of it. We're not going to debate it out. We're not going to challenge it. We're just going to cancel it, which is super harmful. As with many other universities um, here at UVA, we have a strong culture of student self-censorship. Um, I mean, there are, there are multiple polls, I think like maybe even by Gallup that show most of the majority of college students do not feel comfortable expressing their own views. And I think that's definitely true here at the University of Virginia. Personally, that I just don't, I, it's hard for me to even just be like friends with like more liberal people. Um, because like if any kind of politics get, it gets brought up, you just have to kind of, you got, you got to be silent um, because otherwise people, people turn on you nine times out of 10. I think we've really gotten away from the idea of civility, the idea that we need to have common ground and that we agree on certain fundamental principles. I hate the fact that people are like, we need to be civil because I'm like, I don't want to be civil. I want to be chaotic. I want to be creative and crazy. And I want us to question our world for the better. Also, like, what is civility in a country that's so violent, right? When like thousands of black men have died at the hands of police and no one's doing anything about it. Why do I owe it, you know, to frankly people that have been oppressing me? But if we want liberation, and if we want a revolution, are we gonna get it by saying please and thank you, or are we gonna get it by taking it? I have been bullied for my political views. 
when I started telling people openly that I wasn't liberal, um, people definitely treated me differently. And also, uh, being the president of YAF, I have gotten a lot of DMs, um, like threatening our group and threatening the people in it, and people directing others to come to our page and get our names and cyberbully us. It's it's really just ridiculous to be associated with some of the most evil things that exist in the world, and it's just said to you as if it means nothing. Yeah, I, I think obviously my experience is quite different being that I am a liberal and I have openly progressive beliefs. They've definitely had some cyber bullying, weirdly um, on both the far right and the left. Uh, I used to be a Cavalier Daily opinion writer and I wrote one article that angered a lot of people on the right and I had an Infowars article written about me and like some conservative news shows picked it up. I had like, you know, pretty vile internet comments, people saying they wanted to kick my teeth in and so on. And then I wrote another article defending, um, actually defending Yaf against another columnist who argued that they should be punished for saying what I viewed as constitutionally protected speech. And I had people on UVA leftist Twitter saying that they wanted to slap me across the face and someone calling me the ghost of Rush Limbaugh. So what it's really made me realize is that the internet is a terrible forum for having good and reasoned debate. I think people get a lot of social capital by dunking um, on people that they disagree with and kind of having a villain of the day. And, you know, I, I've had the experience of being multiple political beliefs, villain of the day, and it was very weird. The part that really gets me is that when we do events, we don't tell people, we don't publicize our posts online where the event is usually because we can't. We've had multiple police re reports and cases made, um, not because I wanted to, but because we had to. You can't just say, yeah, we disagree. It's like, no, you're shunned out of the conversation. I've decided everything I know, everything about you from one word, conservative, right-leaning. Frustrates me when, when I see these kind of things happening and I go like, you're not gonna convince anyone of anything doing that. Like you make yourself the boogeyman that a lot of conservatives think liberals are. I'm a liberal Democrat, but at the same point, kind of one of my biggest frustrations with um, political discourse here on grounds is that, um, at least on the left, and if you look at Twitter especially, um, it's my way or it's the highway. The problems, and I think that also, unfortunately, um, just simply the presidency of um, you know Donald Trump, I think has really kind of uh, divided our country. And the right especially, I think, has become just uh, such an extreme now. Personally, um, I would disagree with this, the statement that the right has gone to the extreme. Um, a lot of what the right is doing is just reacting to what's happening on the left. You don't have somebody like Donald Trump who's just willing to ram people over, um, then they're, then you're not going to get listened to at all. Um, that's the problem. So you either have conservatives have been given the option. Um, I'm either going to go to my own space, I'm going to go to Parler, I'm going to go to Telegram, I'm going to go to somewhere else, or I'm going to have to just run into the space and I'm going to have to crush people um, because that's the option we've been given. I think that, yes, definitely the left has gone much further to the left over the past four years um, in response to Trump. What really kind of frustrates me, though, is the fact that uh, you're seeing this blind adherence to uh, a demagogue, to be quite honest with you. I think that now, after what you've seen, especially the response that you had after the 2020 election, he's the worst president in American history, hands down. He orchestrated a riot um, with the goal of subverting American democracy. And I think that this adherence and blind faith in this individual, I mean, you know, you're kind of sitting there, you're wondering, you know, you guys drank the Kool-Aid? I mean, I mean, when are you all gonna go down to Guyana and, uh, you know, never mind, but um, jokes aside, it's just simply this blind adherence. I think one of the reasons why I identify as a progressive rather than a leftist is that on college campuses, um, a lot of leftists are very anti-freedom of speech. The thing about free speech, right, is that it depends on who's saying it. It's, it's almost an oxymoron to say free speech is not something that should be up for debate. I think free speech is one of the most imperative values in this country and at this university. That being said, I think free speech has its limits. Um, hate speech, for example. We're finding ourselves literally in a place where all of a sudden, you know, 
what what free speech is allowed is 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 a discussion. In my ideal world, I think the solution to hate speech being covered by free speech is you know some sort of constitutional amendment. What I'm worried about is we're going to get to a point where hate speech is just simply defined as anything we disagree with. It's not as simple as like just saying free speech, right? Like it's never that simple. One of my favorite like Stokely Carmichael quotes is. If a white man wants to lynch me, that's his problem. But if a white man has the power to lynch me, that's my problem. Again, I think we have to think a lot about power and who holds the power. Freedom of speech is the hill that I've chosen to fight and die on. You look back in American history, um, all forms of social progressivism have been controversial. Um, and in a lot of ways, the state has tried to silence it. But because of the First Amendment, they can't. It sounds good to try to keep neo-Nazis from saying what they want to say, but then the wrong person gets in power and all of a sudden saying Black Lives Matter is hate speech. Hate speech is protected speech. Yeah, I think that it's a really slippery slope about like defining, like if we were to say hate speech isn't protected, it's like what defines hate speech. So yeah, I think that's kind of my main concern. Yeah, I would also say it can't be defined. And so once you just outlaw hate speech, you do fall down that slippery slope. But in a general sense, I just, I fear limiting speech and dialogue in any way, shape or form, because the second you do it, you just put a stop sign up to any sort of uh, societal progression. Uh, it's by talking about what we might consider to be hateful that we can affirm it to be hateful. Uh, you know, that's how you disavow horrible ideas or affirm truths. Who decides what hate speech is, is fundamentally up to the government. And I think it is in the best interest of both left-wing belief systems and right-wing belief systems that the state is not involved in deciding whether or not their beliefs are popular enough to be protected. I want to add, I subscribe philosophically to the concept that there is only speech. You don't need to call it free. You don't need to call it hateful. There is just speech. In a free society, all speech is allowed. Once it's not speech, it's violence. And that's something different. It's nice that we can all agree on this, but um, unfortunately, a majority of college students don't think hate speech should be protected. Something that I think about all the time that's a little frustrating to me is that I do see my fellow progressives often um, getting behind uh, wanting to limit so-called hate speech. And I think that's ultimately really harmful. And I think where that comes from is that they see certain right-wing figures talk about free speech and they go, well, if the right likes it, then it must be bad for the left. Therefore, I have to be against it. As someone who is progressive, I think that progressives best achieve their cause by embracing freedom of speech, by embracing civil liberties that benefit everyone. Beta Bridge, uh, so obviously Beta Bridge cuts through Rugby Road. It's a site where you have a lot of students who are coming out and they'll paint messages, uh, you know, whether it be you know, pancakes for Parkinson's, fraternity and sorority life, you know, political causes. It's somewhere where really the university is kind of able to go to that space, be able to relay a message, and where the community is able then in turn to see it. All right, well, what do we want to paint? Like, yes, we, we disagree on a lot, but also I think just being here and, you know, having the off-camera conversations and relating on UVA stuff means we have a lot in common. Something that also I think that shows differences, but the fact that differences are okay, you know, because I think all of our discussion is uh, we didn't, you know, you haven't said anything to me hoping that I'll just suddenly join your side, just hoping that we, but I, I, I don't want to speak for you, but it was hoping that we could engage in a conversation. You know, and at the end of the day, we, we respect that we simply believe both things and we can hash things out. Well, the way in which I would look at it is what's kind of that overarching thing that we can kind of tie ourselves back to. I think on a broad level, we can all say, you know, we're Americans and that's really what kind of unites us. But I think that um, on a more micro level here at the university, I think it's the fact that we're all University of Virginia students, that we're all Wahoos 
And at the end of the day, you know, we may be um, from red states, blue states, and we may have uh, these different um, you know, attitudes and so forth regarding politics. But at the end of the day, we all bleed uh, blue and orange. And I think that that's something that we ought to um, try to incorporate in there in some way. Well, something we can do that um, the older generation in Congress doesn't get done is uh, combine our consensus with how to come up with an actual <laughs> result. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any good ideas for uh, slogans? Don't you all love having your political beliefs at age 20 filmed for posterity I, to haunt you forever? <laughs> I don't know if that will fit on beta. <laughs> It'd be funny if we did like, hashtag hash it out. I don't know, because I know we talked a lot about social media, and I think you said ha hash it out. I think you used those exact words. I mean, it'd be funny to do that, and then we can like print out pictures of like different like documents and pictures and like politicians, what have you, on beta, and like stick it on beta, and it can be like all our different ideas, and we're hashing it out. Hashtag, ha I don't know. Something like that. Cool. Yeah, I like that. I like yeah. That. But I, don't, I don't know if we were supposed to dive into colors. <laughs> but I will say, to go off your point, because I like the idea of the commonality that we all go here at the end of the day, um, you know, Democrat royal blue fades right into navy and Republican <laughs> red fades right into orange. And how nice would it be for those spectrums to combine for UVA blue and orange at the end, you know? Yeah. I don't think I could have said it better. my mask and why the Virginia Tech shirt? I've just had this for like a million years. I use it to paint Beta Bridge. I don't really care if I get it dirty because it's a Virginia Tech sweatshirt, you know? So, yeah. Um, I enjoyed like the painting, um, even though I didn't do much painting because I'm not an artist. I think I did like one letter. I got a couple of bagels, might go for a third one. Um, so it was, it, it was good. Everybody showed up to Beta Bridge today. Uh, uh, and in politics was kind of the last thing uh, that we think of now when we see each other. You know, we've gotten to know each other at this point. As YAF president, I've had really bad Beta Bridge experiences. People come by shouting curse words and uh, flipping us off. And this has been a totally different experience. And I'm still YAF president while doing it. And I'm with people who totally disagree with everything that I do as club president, yet it doesn't matter. And that's awesome. I think something that's kind of concerning is that, you know, as we look for common ground, we also have to keep in mind, like, what does that look like on these issues of, like, white supremacy, racism, sexism. There's, there's no place for common ground on those issues. Either we eradicate it or we don't. I don't think anyone's mind was changed from this. I don't really think that was the purpose of what we were doing. You sit here and you listen to folks talk about how uh, you know, the political discourse in this country is never going to improve, that things are just headed south. And I think that that's not true. I think that the real question is uh, whether or not we can actually go out there and engage with folks who disagree with us, though. And that, that's the big thing. I don't know, maybe it's just because it's like COVID. It's been really interesting and kind of fun to, you know, just do something as silly as like painting Beta Bridge. This feels like UVA, just like painting Beta with some like people, you know. You just watched some college students from across the political spectrum work together to try and find common ground. And no, we did not solve every problem facing politics today, and we might not have even changed many minds. But we did do what few others seem willing to do. 
We got together, we talked about our differences, and we worked together to achieve a shared goal. We learned that it is possible to bring people together to at least look for common ground. And more importantly, this doesn't have to stop just at UVA. We're inviting schools from across the country to participate in what we're calling the Common Grounds Campus Challenge. Just imagine if our collective efforts could lead to a whole new era of cooperation in America. Never heard to dream. You can find more information at the following link. Thank you for watching. I would like to, as you sit, take your seats, um, again, thank these students for the miraculous job they did for all their efforts in tackling these tough issues and often somewhat uncomfortable issues. Uh, they did a fabulous job, so I'm proud of you all. I also want to thank you all for being here tonight, uh, and those of you who are listening in, um, for helping us start the dialogue. So my, it's my honor to um, obviously introduce this panel again. I think that uh, Larry Sabato did a very good job, but I'm gonna have each one of them tell you just a little bit more about themselves and how they got involved with this project. So we'll start. Yeah, just a refresher. Uh, my name is Rad Gillum. Uh, a lot of people ask me how that's pronounced. It's like rapid without the P, Rad. And uh, yeah, I'm a fourth year foreign affairs major. Sean Pivovar. Um, I am a fourth year in the college studying government. Uh, my name is Tom Hunter. I'm a fourth year here at UVA uh, in the college as well, uh, double majoring in history and foreign affairs. Hi, I'm Tom Hayes. I'm a third year um, in Baton studying uh, leadership and public policy. Uh, my name is Miranda Hertz. I'm a third year and I'm studying government and German language. Um, my name is Vidar Hegeman. I'm a second year and I'm studying religious studies. Excellent. So let me just start off with a question I know probably on a lot of minds, and that is what inspired you to take on this tough challenge, and as I said earlier, these very uncomfortable for some uh, issues? And I'll just throw it out to, to any of you. Yeah, I would say um, we started our internship in a very tense political climate, and I think there were several key incidents that had happened on grounds that had kind of gone viral, had been controversial, um, maybe there was a little back and forth in the cab daily about it. And so we were initially thinking about doing a program, an event, uh, to kind of maybe address that, have some students together, uh, see their opinions. Um, but then I had recently just gotten some, like a random bonus from financial aid and I'd used it to buy, buy some film equipment and I'm a, an aspiring filmmaker. So I bought those stuff and I was like, I technically could theoretically do the filmmaking part of this. What if we made a small documentary? Because uh, the Center for Politics does do documentaries, but it was just kind of a lull period between um, different documentary projects they're working on. And yeah, I mean, how did you guys react to it? Yeah, it was incredible. And, you know, we find ourselves in a semester of COVID um, where we're meeting for class virtually, um, and there's not a lot going on, but yet there is a lot going on. And so we, we were trying to find ways that we could come together, make something meaningful, and step into a really tense environment. Um, and what we found as part of that is the fact that we're all apart. And so by making this, we actually came together to do things, like this group right here and the group you saw on screen. And so what we see is even the sheer fact of, I think, being in a room with somebody else uh, who disagrees with you. I mean, we, a lot of us disagree with each other. Um, even that alone reminds us of how important it is just to be with each other in a room um, to, to help find common ground and even just heal a little bit as a nation that's so divided. Good. Anyone else? 
Be good. Okay, good. Let me ask the next one then. Um, did you, any of you go into this project with um, preconceived notions, right, or expectations about the other's point of view? Um, and did you come away from it uh, changed with a changed opinion? Uh, I could go on that. Okay. Um, for me, um, looking at it, I was kind of like, oh, um, hearing this person's a socialist or this person's a liberal Democrat. And for me personally, I just spend probably way too much time on Twitter. So I just automatically think about tweets I've seen. I'm like, oh, that's what I'm going to hear. Um, and I didn't come away with that. I came away with um, thinkers who had actually, who had thought about these issues, who had worked on these issues personally on campus or back home. So that was um, really good to see. It was also good to see how civil people could be. Um, I honestly didn't expect, I expected it to be a lot more tense and that wasn't the case. Um, people got along, um, the filmmakers, the participants, it was, I, um, it, was, it was awesome to see. I personally didn't come away changed, but usually it takes me a while to change any of my opinions on anything. Um, so that's, that's a personal thing. Um, but for me, I definitely, it was compelling to see the different perspectives for sure. Can I follow up on that and just ask you, so what do you think made it work? Right? Like you said, everybody had very obviously diverse opinions. We saw that from the film. But what made you all come together and actually get along? Um, I can, yeah. So to follow up on that, I think what really made it work was that um, we are a part of the same university. Um, we're all here. We're, we're all on the same grind. It was COVID. There was a lot that brought us together during that time. Like, OK, we all got it. We're all online. We're all wearing masks 97% of the time. We're not online. Um, so it was, it was that kind of thing. We're all, we're all going through the same struggle. This is something that takes us out of that lull of COVID, took us out of that lull of the um, very tense political discourse and allowed us to all come together and kind of say, OK, um, here, here's a chance to get to work one on one. Here's a chance for me personally to kind of view these perspectives outside of Twitter, outside of CNN or Fox or wherever. So. Excellent. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah. just definitely echoing um, what Vidar had said. Um, I came into this project and I was actually working on um, another project here at the center um, doing uh, research into the Kennedy assassination. That's one of Professor Shabato's big, um, you know, uh, interest, if uh, any of y'all know him. And so I was doing that, and then uh, Molly had actually reached out to me asking me if I wanted to join the project. And I was like, sure. And they were kind of explaining it to me, and I was like, are you sure that we're going to be able to get all these folks into the same room and be able to actually do this? Uh, because, I mean, for a lot of these folks, uh, you know, you, you got a lot of folks who are very active on Twitter. And that's really kind of your assumption that you're getting in terms of, uh, not only where their political views are, but also the way in which they're going to be conducting themselves. And so coming into that, I was very much expecting that to be uh, how the conversation was going to go. And what really struck me, though, was nobody talked over one another, nobody cursed out anybody, and nobody walked off set. I mean, it was truly, you, know, you had the president of YDSA and the president of YAF sitting in the same room. You know, it, it was a miracle that you were able to have that happen. <laughs> And uh, for it to be such a success, and I think that really kind of speaks to this underlying desire by students to have substantive conversation. And I think that social media, to a large extent, really distorts uh, so much of what the political sentiment is here and also where folks want to go in terms of engaging with one another. Excellent. The documentary shows how you guys did pull it together and work together. But let's pull the curtain back, and can you tell me um, what were some of the most challenging things that went on behind the scenes? Uh, well, we definitely had our fair, of, uh, fair share of technical challenges, which is, <laughs> I mean, I've never made a documentary. I think this, Rod's an amazing filmmaker, obviously, but I think this was somewhat new for him, too. Um, yeah, I mean, we definitely underestimated how long it took to set up the equipment and how, you know, how long we would need the spaces and stuff like that. But on a more serious note, um, you know, our, our group who made the documentary itself was, you know, a project in working across political divides. We have two conservatives, two liberal, and self, a centrist, a centrist <laughs> who describes himself as. Um, so yeah, I mean, and that's difficult in any sense, but making a project about politics with people you very much disagree with is not easy. Um, so there are definitely challenges with that, but I think ultimately, I think that constant tension between left and right really allowed us to create 
and I don't want to say an unbiased film because I think that's impossible, but you know, as, as a film as reflective of the interviews and what we were really doing as possible. So I think in the end it was, I think it couldn't have been done without having a wide range of perspectives. Perfect. Yeah, just to come off of that a little bit, if I mm -hmm. may, um, I, I would encourage you all to check out, Molly and I co-wrote an op-ed in the Cavalier Daily um, on just this topic, on how we were really coming from all different sides of the spectrum. And I mean, she said this a little bit, right? Like we, when we approach certain questions, when we, when we approach certain words, like free speech or civility, those words are charged depending on what side of the aisle you come from. And the way for me as a conservative, thinking of free speech, thinking the word freedom, right? That, that comes with certain notions and certain ways that I want to frame things, certain ways that I want to think about August 11th and 12th, um, all throughout the film that I needed a counterpart on the left um, to help me sort of work out and figure out what was there so that we could make sure that we were really casting a wide net and making sure that our participants were in a place where they could really come um, without kind of uh, some preset notions that were going to steer the documentary one way or the other. Awesome. So you guys all found the way to obviously create the dialogue, but so help me, do you know, what do you think um, is the problem, or better put, how do you think um, people today, uh, why, or why do people, sorry, today find it so difficult to be civil um, when they talk about politics or their beliefs? I genuinely think that you know, we are in a pandemic and a lot of us spent a year, maybe even more at home on our screens. And there was a lot of real stuff going on in the country too that was really tense and um, hard for a lot of us. And so those conversations were all happening in the virtual sphere. Um, and so when your interaction with other people is the story that they put or the tweet that they retweet or the you know, the vicious YouTube comment that they write, you know, with no repercussions. Um, I think that just creates, I mean, there's these problems exist in the real world, but then they're amplified online. And that's a real thing that we all know. And the social dilemma came out last year and that was talking about this very thing. So that's definitely contributed to the chaos of the environment and the amplification of the division. Um, and then, you know, we, the social media generation, are especially prone to getting really locked into that. And so I think, like, you asked earlier about were we surprised or did we have preconceived notions about people? I mean, a lot of people we reached out to, we reached out to because they have such strong online personalities and they're, they're clearly, like, you know, they're people of conviction. Um, and so that's kind of the basis we even use to figure out who are the people we're going to reach out to or who are the people who are most vocal online. And... A lot of times it was surprising, like the people who were most vocal online, maybe even harsh, were so kind and sweet in person. And so, like, and you, would, you just would not guess that that was the person behind the, the, the screen. So, yeah, I think that's definitely part of it, and that's rooted in real world issues, but yeah. Good. Any other comments? Please. It's very easy to sit there and you know when you're on you know Twitter or something like that, and you see something that you disagree with, it's very easy to you know tweet back. You know, I think you're a moron or something like that. But then to actually see somebody who's expressing that uh, political belief in person, um, and to say that same thing, that that you wouldn't do that. Um, and I think that that's really one of the important things about this documentary is the fact that it was in person. Um, you know, you got to think about the context in which this thing was actually being filmed. This was in April of this year. So this is you know, right when students were starting to get vaccinated. Um, the fact that we were even able to have the face shields on um, was a very radical departure from how it had previously been. And you know, to be able to sit down and to be able to engage with folks in person, I think really kind of changed the narrative in certain respects. And I think that people were a lot more willing to engage with views they disagreed with and more willing um, to show uh, civility and respect because there's somebody who's right there in front of you. That's a person as opposed to, you know, there's a tweet and that's how I'm going to engage with them. Good. Let me ask you this. Do you think that social media actually has created a divide or that the divide was there and we're just now more aware of it because obviously we see it over 24 seven? Yeah. I was just going to say, I think it's definitely exacerbated it because you can still have interaction and claim you're having interactions without really having interactions, without really like 
having any such sort of debate or sharing any real ideas. So I think people feel like they're engaging with people and they're, you know, um, trying to talk things out or whatever, but it's, it's really like they're not. So I think, um, I think it's definitely exacerbated it in that it kind of gives people a false sense of, oh, well, I'm, like we're having a conversation, but you're not. Yeah. That. I think social media has definitely exacerbated it, but not just uh, the echo chambers and everything that's part of it. Um, but I definitely think an element of it is because the political divides we see are not just like left and right, um, because the coalitions of left and right versus 2004 are radically different from what they are in 2020, 2021. Um, so I think it has a lot to do with amplifying. People are able to amplify what, oh, this is what I thought the problem was. Now I can see it. Or also it's a lot harder to trust the narratives that we got from our mainstream, whether that, those, that mainstream was left or right, it's a lot harder to see that and say, okay, I believe this, this is the truth. A lot of the divide is working class versus elite, it's experts versus non-experts, it's suburban versus rural, and those issues get amplified when you can see, okay, my people are over here on social media, so now, now that I'm getting this reinforced all the time, I'm gonna turn this into a physical action by moving out of where, wherever, if I'm in New York City, now I'm gonna move down to Florida because those people are more like me, right? So that's where also you get the divide. You, get, you have social media also spurring people to take physical action um, based on other factors. Do you have any concrete ideas as to how we get away from the discord, right, and the vitriol of social media and actually get back to civil dialogues? It comes down to sitting in a room with people and talking to them. And, and that seems like a kind of a simple thing, but the point of this film was that like, we actually had to work to do that. We had to call up the president of YAF and the president of YDSA to actually get them to come in a room and talk to each other. Um, and I think we all take that for granted. Well, I talk, with, I talk with my friends about politics. Well, is that your bubble that you're living in all the time, right? How much do you really disagree? And so what we hope that people can take away is that um, it is as easy as talking to somebody and, and not just talking to someone, but actually listening to what they have to say um, and entering into a serious conversation in a way where, like we see here, that it, it wasn't really a debate, right? It wasn't like achieving, like nobody was looking to win in that conversation. Um, and that's what changed it from what we see a lot of the times is, is there's a goal in mind that, so, you know, it's a, it's a zero sum game that somebody has to come out on top. Um, but if we can go in and just say, let's sit in a room together and talk and listen to each other, um, that sounds small, but it actually can have enormous impacts. I think one more step is also to work on something together. Because um, I think what was unique about both what the film was showing, but also the film itself, was that you know, we did come from different perspectives and we had a goal. I mean, we had a thing, we had a deadline, we had to work on, um, we had to work through a lot of disagreements about how we present things. I mean, ed I mean, a documentary is real and nonfiction, but it's also, there's a lot of choices and editing choices about how things are presented, how things are framed. And we had a constant conversation throughout the process um, where, you know, someone would say, you know, I think if we, if we put something forward this way, it's going to, it's going to sound like this to these people. So are you sure you want to do that? And so, but the fact that we all had different perspectives means kind of like Molly said, on aggregate, there's this really sense of compromise and none of it was forced. It's just the fact that we were all coming from different perspectives, working on one thing together. And so I think, and then also painting Beta Bridge, you know, maybe they, some people weren't fully in the message, but the fact that they all showed up and were sharing the paint and like taking turns, writing different letters down and coming up with ideas and working on something together is really interesting. It doesn't have to be policies and bills. It can be community projects. It can be, um, you know, volunteering together. But when we step out and we do life together and we work on projects together in an individual or maybe communal sense, I think that can go a long way because this is not going to be solved, uh, you know, in Congress. <laughs> oh, shocker. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment? Yeah, is really important too is you know finding commonalities be so, like outside of politics and you know maybe finding that you share the you both of you guys have the same favorite artist for music or your same favorite movie and sort of going outside of politics and realizing oh this person is not just defined by what they believe in politically but oh we share the same likings for a whole bunch of other stuff. Is there is there more we can do here? 
at UVA to make this happen. I mean, what you have done tonight is amazing. It's not only exciting, but it's encouraging. Um, but you know, what else can we do um, to help you, obviously, and to help the other students? One of the students uh, in the interviews actually mentioned the idea of having a uh, kind of like a student council of political clubs that could get together like once a semester, once a year. Um, and so I think, I mean, there's things we could do. There's repeated, you know, maybe conferences, maybe ways that we can bring people together for events. Because I think it does require some sort of organized thing. It's not just going to organically happen. Um, so I think the more that that's encouraged, maybe that resources are put, put towards that in ways that are real and you're bringing all voices to the table, not just the voices you want, um, could be a really good step in that direction. But that, that is a choice that we have to make. Excellent. Other ideas? that uh, for me personally um, that I've found to be very effective was, um, so for two years I was an RA. And so um, within my first year hall, just seeing you know, folks who are randomly assigned to live on hall um, come together, just hang outside and to have discussions, um, you know, whether it's about sports or you know, girls they like or um, politics. And you kind of get that free flow of ideas in exchange. And I think that that's something that um, is really impactful. And that was something that I really kind of promoted as an RA, was having folks from you know, all ends of the political spectrum go out there and throw out your ideas. Be free to share those. Um, obviously be civil when other people are sharing their ideas, but having that kind of a community, having that type of environment, I think is so important. And I think that, um, at least in my mind, the best way to kind of create that is through the residential communities, because it's all randomly assigned. And you're getting folks from all walks of life who are coming in there, who are going to be living on your hall. And, you know, it's those 2 a.m. conversations about, you know, you know, I mean, whatever is going on in the world that I think really, um, you know, you can find those points of commonality and you can also just engage in a way that um, you wouldn't otherwise be able to normally do. Fabulous. Yeah, I've got a question. Now, I heard a lot about and during the documentary that there are certain uh, students who don't feel like they can express their point of view, and I've heard this before, right? Um, who is it that obviously needs to um, obviously understand this better? You know, what can we do? Is it students? Is it professors? Is it the administration? I mean, where do we start so that we make every student here at least feel like they can voice, obviously, their beliefs? starts, and this is difficult, but I, I think it starts with every single one of us to look back at ourselves and say, are, am I the kind of person that someone will feel comfortable telling their political views, right? Like, there, there are structural things like a professor, for instance, making sure that they're opening, you know, views to the public or things like that, but actually looking back at yourself and saying, am I the kind of person that somebody would actually feel like talking to? is enormously powerful because it's exactly the sort of people who don't take the time to think that. Um, and I can call myself that, you know, I think we all can at some points in our lives that, that are the ones who create the problem. Do you find it difficult? I, mean, I know obviously having students that are so busy, they're athletes or they're, you know, busy working a job while they're going to school, getting their attention. I mean, you are all involved in politics, right? And this is a natural fit and a wonderful fit, fortunately. But how do we get these other students, right, to pay to listen, right, to obviously even take the time? I, mean, I think that kind of really speaks to, um, you know, the, the goal of the university should be to produce citizen leaders. I mean, that was Jefferson's idea behind the university. And I think that obviously we need to update that for what that means in the 21st century. But uh, that's definitely something that we need to um, emphasize is getting folks actually engaged about politics because um, what we've seen over the past however many years is that a lack of engagement in politics, a lack of understanding about the issues, and just simply you know, responding to what you see on social media, if you're voting that way, uh, you know, you're not going to get uh, results that you want, results that are going to actually make a meaningful impact in your lives or the lives of those around you. And so I think that getting folks to be more you know, informed about politics, really kind of promoting that discourse and making folks feel comfortable. I think that's, at the end of the day, what matters the most. And I think presently, 
Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but I think that stuff like this is really kind of a step in the right direction. Excellent. Can I ask? It is a tough one. Because the loudest voices are often the ones that are most provocative and or most enter entertaining. And I feel like that's definitely something we've seen is if I'm gonna be heard, I need to be outrageous. Whether it's like outrageously funny or outrageously offensive, I need to be outrageous. And so, I mean, I don't think I'm gonna pretend to know how to fix that because that is, again, like that's kind of what sells uh, on social media. That's what sells, you know, everywhere. So to just get people to care about, you know, nice things like civil discourse, like I just, it's a hard thing to, advertise you know and so yeah i think it is just kind of by like sean said just being yourself in your community and hoping that that rubs off on other people so on a personal note what was one of the best things i'm going to ask each of you um that you took from this whole experience um, what you learned obviously throughout um the process going forward and we'll start um, I guess, yeah, to start with me. Um, for me personally, I think it's kind of harking back to what I said before, that I don't get to often have these conversations. Because um, even in like my own house, I'm radically different from where my parents are. But if I, and so if I start going for too long, they're like, all right, you're done. Like, stop talking. <laughs> um, so I, I don't, so this is really, it was a good chance to kind of, to have, to have that conversation, to get um, to know everyone here better. I think that was a big thing for me. Um, I think I joined Chi Alpha and in, in uh, Rad's core group um, after this experience or like right during it. And I was kind of like, okay, like, I, and I kind of helped, it helped me find purpose outside of politics. That's, that, that was the big thing. Um, and again, getting to see these perspectives outside of Twitter, out in a, in a place where they could be really formative, where you can have those discussions off camera, or you can be like, hey, um, I read this book by Stokely Carmichael or whoever, you might like this book, even though it's something I might not agree with, it's something that I found interesting and that you probably will too, just kind of have those little um, engagements and niceties that we often take for granted is something that uh, I really appreciated. For me, my biggest takeaway from learning, from working on this project was probably that it's very important to interact with people that you probably wouldn't feel comfortable with otherwise and breaking out of your circle um, because you'll learn something new that you might not have otherwise. Um, and that, oh gosh, I'm blanking. That's good. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I think that's really important to break out of your circle and um, to sort of be open-minded to other people's opinions and views. Um, I would say the best thing that came out of this for me was, I don't know why, it um, was really good friends that I would never have ever, ever, ever met. Um, and yeah, I mean, also, you know, the learning things from making the documentary and seeing everyone, but I think that was honestly probably like the greatest part of it for me. Yeah, definitely. Echoing Molly's point, I think that um, being able to work with these folks for the past year has just been truly a blessing. It's been, uh, it's been a blast. And so I've really enjoyed that. I'm enjoying, or excited rather, about where we're going to be going with this in the future. Um, and then for me also, I think what I also have really appreciated is, um, you know, walking out of this, I, I personally have a sense of hope about our future. I think that oftentimes folks uh, look at our present state of politics and say, you know, there's no way to fix it. You know, we're, we're doomed. And for me, though, I think that our best days lie ahead. I think that we're at a critical crossroad in our history, but I think that going forward, we can move um, collectively. And I think that things like this really kind of speak to that. I think that there's still that spirit in our country. And so um, that, that was definitely my big takeaway. And I hope folks uh, in the audience got that as well. Yeah, um, I, I echo all of that. I, I love the friendships that we've developed. We, uh, we, it's been a lot of over business things, but we've had so much time for fun in the midst of it. And we were laughing together last night, getting ready for all of this, um, just kind of reminiscing on everything. And I think the other big takeaway for me was something that Vidar mentioned earlier, which is realizing that people that we disagree with um, are, <laughs> are, are better people than maybe we assume they are. Um, and they're a lot smarter than I think we a lot of times assume they are. And that, <laughs> I mean, we all, right? Everybody's laughing, but we all do it, right? And, and I think t taking that really seriously and saying like myself, like as a conservative and like 
interacting with the president of the Socialist Club and realizing like she's thought a lot about what she believes and she said a lot of very interesting and very powerful things, things that I still disagree with and um, I'd love to parse out further, but things that I, I take seriously and things that I see come from a place of like wanting to make things better for people. And that, it, and, it, and again, it, it sounds like, like, oh yeah, that's obvious, Sean, you know, that's a platitude, but it's actually very serious that we, we really internalize that kind of message. And we really take that and we start there. So my dad and I joke about when you watch the behind the scenes featurettes with your DVDs and movies, um, actors and actress, actresses tend to always say, you know, this is, this is the best crew I've ever worked with. <laughs> and like, for me, this was the first crew I've ever worked with. <laughs> Therefore, the best crew. <laughs> and so it's been so meaningful to me on so many levels, like relationally, like everyone's mentioned. Um, and I mean, I really came into the internship wanting to get my hands on like documentary process. And I thought it would be on some big budget center documentary, but the fact that, you know, like I just asked, would you guys be willing to do a documentary? And everyone gave a resounding yes on day one, day two, day three, throughout the process and spent like countless hours helping out and just really shouldering this, you know, burden together was so incredibly meaningful and the resources and the help that the Center for Politics gave to us, um, lifting us up, allowing us to have these ideas and not saying, oh, that's too ambitious for you students. Like there was never that kind of like, um, yeah, forgetting the word, derog like just down looking. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, attitude, incredibly supportive and full of belief. And so just getting it done, honestly, and being able to look back and say, hey, we did it, is, is my, my favorite part. So I'm gonna, one last question. One last quick question for you. I know you all are so passionate and it's fabulous what you've done tonight. I know you want this to continue. So tell me a little bit about the Common Grounds Campus Challenge that you've set up to do just that. Um, so besides the Common Grounds Campus Challenge, there's also the Unify, Unify America Challenge going on right now. Um, so there is a tab on the Center for Politics website. Um, and basically when you register, you will get matched up with someone who is on the opposite political spectrum that you are. Um, and you'll meet up, obviously virtual, um, talk to them for about 30 minutes, an hour, however long you want. Um, and to sort of see if you can come across any agreements um, we all have done it. I think it was very interesting. Not that, um, like, you know, like any of our opinions change, but again, it's really, it was really nice to sort of hear the opposite side and sort of be open and hear new ideas. Yeah. We're very, we're very excited about the Common Grounds Campus Challenge because this is one way that the film doesn't just end at, you know, okay, we showed this and we all go our separate ways. Um, this is going to be kind of a challenge that we try to share it in high schools across Virginia and at universities uh, where we challenge you know, interested students in all those you know, schools to form a team you know, of about maybe no more than eight people that kind of roughly represents a balanced uh, set of perspectives. And we're gonna have them have a conversation similar to what was in the film. So they'll watch the film, they'll see kind of the format. And then um, they'll have a conversation and then they'll be challenged with uh, working on a community project together or an art project or, you know, it could be a play, it could be a short film, it could be a mural. Um, and we're gonna have them collaborate and brainstorm. Um, and then I think we're going to kind of assess it basically based on creativity. Uh, and then the craftsmanship, you know, is it a good project? And then also the contextual relevance, does it, you know, what, does this project mean to the community? Beta Bridge is very significant to UVA, so you know I'm sure there's other Beta Bridges at other in other towns that you know people can do projects and work together on. And I, I really think that working together towards a shared goal across differences is a really key thing that this shows. And it's not rocket science, so we're gonna um, we're gonna share that and try to spread that and 
we thank you for being here and we would love and appreciate if you guys could help spread the word. We're gonna release the film online on YouTube so it's gonna be easily accessible and I mean, if each of you could sp spread it to all your friends, then we'll, we'll get some traction. So we really ask that you guys can really share it with all your networks and when it comes to really announcing and getting this challenge on, on the road, we're gonna um, ask for your help as well. Uh, when the students are done working on the project, we're gonna ask them to uh, tweet uh, and at the Center for Politics and also write the hashtag hash it out, which was in the film. And that's just gonna be one other way that, you know, an idea that a student had in the film lives on and can take, you know, real world uh, form and application. So we're really excited about that. And that's something that we're gonna be focusing on, um, yeah, in the next few weeks and months. Thank you so much. I want to thank you. Oh, you want to add one last thing? Sorry. Make sure you use you use the hashtag that was in the film. So hash it out. Yeah. <laughs> thank you again for everything you did. I personally will go away, and I hope so many of you will. I think with the comment of the night was, you know, we don't have to agree, but I still like them. <laughs> That's okay, right? That's the whole goal, isn't it? We can still be friends despite the fact that we think differently about politics or whatever beliefs. So thank you. At this point, I'm going to introduce, um, obviously, a man who doesn't need introduction, Larry Sabato. <laughs> Everything. They did everything. So I really need this money. And in the end, he said, ah, it's only money. And that, that basically is our attitude at the Center for Politics. It's only money. And if they're doing something good with it, and goodness knows our country needs this. Oh, my God. We're, we're splitting apart. And it's really scary. And you've got a majority in some areas of the country that want secession. And we, we've got to do something. And here's a positive step that can be taken. And it's all due to them. So as we conclude and leave, please give them a raucous round of applause. concludes our evening and uh, thank you all again for coming and just keep the dialogue going thanks everybody